Exactly, exactly. There's something that it is sensing, and there are different things it can be sensing that's leading it to act this way. It could be that there's a low level toxin in there that we can't see and haven't tested for, an infection, a heavy metal, a pesticide, that kind of thing. Or it could be that the signals, it, it's a lookalike. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you here on another Autoimmune Hour. You can find 470-plus episodes over at understandingautoimmune.com. And I'm just thrilled that the show is still going You know, it's been almost a decade, so here we go. (laughs) I'm just having a great time, always learning more, understanding deeper. And tonight we have a great return guest. And this is a topic I think is top of mind for multiple reasons. So I'm really glad that I'm having an expert on. We've had her on before and she's awesome. So fasten your seatbelts because I'm introduce her. Uh, Dr. Jenny Tefankian, she is a naturopathic physician and she has been treating chronic illness for uh, over two decades. And having complex chronic fatigue herself, she had no choice but to dig deep into the literature and uncover the root causes of chronic fatigue. And through her research and experience, she's developed an effective system to unlock the five core root causes so that people who are too exhausted to function can function. (laughs) I think like, what a novel concept. (laughs) So what I love about Jenny is yes, her issue was chronic fatigue, But her research has uncovered, is not limited. All of the things she's uncovered, especially these five core root causes, a lot of autoimmune is run by the same system. So I love having her on because oftentimes, even though I technically don't have chronic fatigue, I have a lot of the symptoms. And her secret power is her ability to combine her left brain, a functional medicine approach with her deep, creative right brain. (laughs) And this allows for her to just see amazing connections. I've said before on the show that oftentimes I'm always amazed by my guests because there are people who the obvious isn't obvious until it's commented on. And Dr. Jenny often comments on things. And I'm like, now that you said that, that's so obvious. (laughs) So (laughs) one of the things we're going to talk about today, because I think it's really important, is brain inflammation. You might be going, what, Sharon? Yeah, so the kind of the pain, the stiffness you get in your hands and or your, your feet, maybe mm-hmm. you can get that in your brain too, right? And I have noticed a huge uptick. This is the science of Sharon. I don't have any research behind it other than just interviewing and talking to lots of people. I've noticed a huge uptick, and I'm wondering. I don't know the root causes, but I'm wondering: is it like long COVID? I guess we can say that word now on <laughs> on podcasts. I I don't know. Jenny, help me out here because I've been seeing what I think a lot more people talking about brain inflammation. How do you describe brain inflammation? Because in my research, I saw like the medical encephalitis and I also saw what they were calling neuroinflammation. And I think we're more talking about the brain neuro part, right? Were you thinking myelogic encephalitis, ME? Yes, absolutely. That's what Yeah, myelogic encephalitis is... The term that people are trying to move, replacing chronic fatigue syndrome with myalgic encephalitis, it's what most of the world uses. There are other terms that they're trying to use as well. And the myalgic encephalitis does seem to explain better what is going on with people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And you talk about the autoimmune, I know this is the autoimmune hour, and I love coming back on here with you. I have always 
held back from identifying chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, as an autoimmune condition. I did a presentation a few years ago to some physicians. They invited me to come talk on an autoimmune panel to, with a bunch of doctors. And I would say there is autoimmune-like behavior dancing around this. And I realized that some of that's my own resistance to this identity of autoimmune condition because I think that it's easy to over-identify and feel powerless. And I'm all about people feeling empowered when they're dealing with their healthcare. And I think that that was my block. Personally, I can own that. When I was diving into the research around the newer upcoming research and starting to look at what we can now see is happening in the brain with inflammation, it starts to make a lot more sense that the, the fatigue and a lot of the symptoms that people get from chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis, or from all of these other autoimmune conditions, or from stress, traumatic brain injuries, any anything that creates impact in the brain, toxic exposure, is an autoimmune condition. It is the body starting to destroy its own cells out of an act of self-protection. I'm glad you said that because whenever I hear someone say the body is attacking itself, my hackles go up because I just know the body is about survival and it wouldn't right. attack itself without a specific and very urgent reason. Exactly. Exactly. There's something that it is sensing and there are different things it can be sensing that's leading it to act this way. It could be that there's a low level toxin in there that we can't see and haven't tested for an infection, a heavy metal, a pesticide, that kind of thing. Or it could be that the signals, it, it's a lookalike problem. You're arresting the wrong person because they have a similar profile. And that can also be <laughs> like or... <laughs> so, It looks close but... enough. We're here. We've got the handcuffs and the gun. Like we might as well do it. Unfortunately, <laughs> we all know this is a real problem in the world too with the... Let me talk about that, though, because the thing that's coming up for me and one of my recent explorations that have helped me a lot is understanding the role my autonomic nervous system plays mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. The sudden rush of an adrenaline it right. messes up my whole body chemistry, even though logically I'm safe. There are times when the body, I'll just feel this rush of adrenaline and I'm like, okay, what is my autonomic nervous system trying to alert me to? So... That messes with the brain, I think, because then could be all of a sudden some anxiety pops up and all sorts of other things. Are you talking about the adrenaline rush you get from thinking about something where you consciously know you're stressed out about it? Oh, I didn't hit record for my last podcast. <laughs> yes, yeah, Anne, but it's both because sometimes I'll just be walking and it's almost as if my spidey sense goes, and I'll feel something and I can't really put my yeah. finger on that. Yes, not hitting record <laughs> inside yeah. joke, folks. Works because that definitely is a, a rush of adrenaline and, and yeah. self-condemnation. I also sometimes feel it just maybe case in point, not so much now, but during the, the, the last couple of years, I was hypersensitive to where I went and how I went and when I went. Mm -hmm. And one time I was in a large department store and I heard someone coughing just like six feet away from me, like mm -hmm. hacking up a lung. Mm -hmm. And that just set my nervous system mm -hmm. all, all a flutter. That adrenaline rush, especially if we're in that chronic adrenaline rush state of mind, it can definitely begin to be part of one of the picture that can lead to this chronic inflammation in the brain. And one of the things that we've talked about that we know is one of the things that I find really interesting that I'm beginning to see is I'm thinking about patients, thinking about my own personal history, my family's history, looking at the literature, listening to the latest presentations from the NIH on chronic fatigue and ME, is that there's a real common thing that's happening when you have people who have a tendency towards depression and or anxiety, they have a chronic fatigue, my ME or autoimmune kind of picture. They have brain fog. All of the things that are happening in the brain are the same with this. It's all the same kind of inflammation that's happening in the brain. And the thing that I think should really get all of our attention, certainly has mine, is that it's the same thing that leads to dementia. <laughs> Alzheimer's, the Parkinson's, the ALS, it's like it's all the dementias. It's all about brain inflammation. It's all about that 
blood brain barrier being leaky, things getting through it that shouldn't get through again, the toxins, the viruses, those kinds of things. And then the brain having a response to it that gets out of control, that doesn't stop. Which makes sense if we think about, I don't know why we think about our brain differently than our gut or something, but if leaky <laughs> gut, which they've proven is a real thing, yeah, we have a leaky brain. Yeah, it is the same. And, it, and if you have a leaky gut, you have a leaky brain. And if you have a leaky brain, you have a leaky gut. And you also have leaky mitochondria. If you have either of those, you have leaky mito mitochondria. Oh and... my gosh, I feel like I need an umbrella here. <laughs> No, you don't need an umbrella and you don't even need fear. And that's the thing that I, I feel like is really important to interject right now. There's a certain amount of fear that motivates us and peak your brain and go, oh, I need to pay attention to that. I don't want to become like grandma or dad in my case. Yet, I really think that we should use that stimulus of, oh, no, this could become, this could get worse if I don't do something about it as a stimulus to get us to really own our own power and what it is that we can do for our healthcare so that we can start feeling better, so that we can stop the cycle. Dale Bredesen, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, he's great. I had a chance to meet him this fall and <laughs> I got to tell him the truth, which is that he has a small following of naturopaths who just absolutely adore him because he, as an allopathic-minded physician, he went into find the cure for Alzheimer's. He was looking for a drug for Alzheimer's. And he went and became a researcher, then realized he had to become a medical doctor and ran a clinic just studying Alzheimer's. And what he found out was it is reversible. You can slow it down and reverse it and not get it. And the way you do this is all through lifestyle, like all of it through lifestyle, which is crazy. And I'm not crazy, but it's crazy that there is what I mean by crazy is that you've got somebody who studied this for 15 years, and this is the conclusion he's come to. And so I think, again, it's just important for us to realize the amount of impact we can have with the decisions we make every single day about what are we eating? How are we eating it? How are we breathing? How are we handling that stress? response that is in our body that comes up automatically. What are we choosing to do? And when do we notice, like you in that department store, we all have that. We have, whether it's conscious or subconscious, we have things that trigger that stress response. And the question is, how quickly can we recognize it and then choose to direct our nervous system into a different state? Absolutely. And there's so much to cover there. One of the things that I did want to just backtrack about and describe how people describe brain fog to you, because I think people hear that and they also hear the term fibro fog and other things like that. If you had asked me a few years ago, are you having brain fog? I would have said no. But now that I have a more nuanced idea of what brain fog is, my answer would have been completely different back then. So right. let's describe what are some of these things that we might be noticing fall into this catch-all term of like brain fog or fibro fog or brain inflammation? That's such a good question. People have different experiences of it. So I'll give you some of the things that patients have told me and what I've experienced myself when it's there for me. So you can feel like cotton wool in the brain. It feels, oh, if I could just... If I could just you want that cup of coffee or something like that to just clear the clouds, it's a little bit fuzzy in there. It just feels like you can't think. A lot of people who are professionals who are used to having a thinking brain that functions at a high level, it can feel just, it's a little bit like, how come I can't just get my engine to turn over? What's that? You're trying to get the engine to turn and the battery's not there. It's like, Rear! it's not, not quite happening. That's one of the things. The other is you're noticing that things are more challenging and that can be a whole a whole array. So one could be word finding is a sign of brain fog. What's her name? The one with the cat, the purple cat. It's like, what's her name? Or it can be not things, places where you should feel familiar, don't feel familiar anymore. I had very, very severe brain fog during one of my mold times where I was driving away from the building where my husband works and I didn't know where I was. Now, the thing is that we own that building. I directed the remodeling of that building. I know exactly where that building is. But because my brain fog was so bad, I was actually lost in a familiar place. That's an extreme form. And that freaked me out. 
It also scared me because my dad at the time had been diagnosed with a dementia. And I was like, oh, here I go. But fortunately, that went away. The other times of brain fog, it's interesting that the brain fog, brain fatigue is right next to each other. So brain fog and brain fatigue, brain fatigue can be like, I used to be able to concentrate for hours reading difficult text. And now after 10 minutes, I'm kind of like, oh, I'm distracted and not able to focus as well. It's if you were able to write briefs or papers or do your work, and then you're finding that your concentration time is down, you're not finding you can connect higher level concepts quite in the same way as you used to. Those can all be signs of brain fog. Too often, those people go in and start complaining about those at age 40, 50, 60, and they're brushed off and told, oh, it's just normal aging. That's not true. We have people who are in their 90s whose brains still work really well. There are things that we can do to keep our brains so that they are high functioning throughout all of our decades. Okay. So what if we're on the higher end of that age range you gave, 40, 50, 60? <laughs> what if we're on the higher edge of that? Yeah. Is it too late? Because I'm thinking, okay, I've had all these decades of a lifestyle that maybe said, oh, well, I'll give up sugar tomorrow or, oh, I'll walk tomorrow. And yeah. tomorrow is always tomorrow. Is it too yeah. late? We are still developing neurons. We still have new ability to develop new neurons. And that's not what we believed even, I don't know, 30 years ago. We thought that the brain was plastic when we were young and that it wasn't plastic as we aged. We now all know, I, I believe, right? Everyone knows that. We all know that we can, we're still neuroplastic till the day we die. We also can build new neurons. Now, do we build as many as a four-year-old? No. Can we change? Yes. Can we heal? Yes. Can you get the inflammation down? Yes, absolutely. Can you completely reverse a full-blown dementia? <laughs> I actually have a really crazy experience about my dad that we probably don't have to time to go into where he did experience that. But I think that his experience was a real kind of miraculous little thing that happened. I do see people who are able to get their brain function to improve massively, no matter what. I'm going to end gentle because I've read a few stories about things such as music, like puzzles, crossword yeah. puzzles, things like that. Yeah also help versus changing exercise diet and some of the very obvious ones. People who study music definitely have a stronger brain development in certain areas and that lasts throughout their lifetime. Picking up and learning something new is really valuable and that does help build new neurons and it can definitely help with memory and that kind of thing. But there has to be an important key. And I think this might cross you off a list from making music work for you. You need to enjoy it. It needs to bring you pleasure. It has to be fun. Like for me to learn a language, I'd be like, but if you like learning languages, then go for it. For me, learning a new dance step would be fun because I love to dance. So for me, a dance class would be a good idea of something to do. So what is it that you like, that you enjoy? And learning that thing is going to help you. Yes, music is great. So if you like to learn music, always wanted to learn how to play the flute, then go for it. That's going to be really good for your brain. There are certain things that you can look at what it is that you're being challenged with. And if you practice that thing, then that's going to help that thing. For, for instance, my getting lost, being in a place that was familiar and was unfamiliar to me, Clearly, I had massive inflammation and I had to get rid of the toxic exposure. I had to get the inflammation down. I had to heal my brain. And there are certain nutrients and things that I use and that that's important to do if you're in that situation. But the actual part of my brain that was having a hard time remembering where things are is part of your spatial memory. I've always had really excellent spatial memory. I'm the finder in the family. If somebody's lost a sock or a phone or keys, I'm the one that remembers where I saw it and I can go through my photos like this. That part of my brain is not as good as it used to be. And one of the ways that I can improve that is by doing puzzles. Because puzzles are looking at shapes and you're looking at shapes and that's it's the same place. So I bought myself a puzzle of the world, because I always wanted to understand geography better. And I do this world puzzle and it really helps. So if you're having a harder time remembering where things are and finding things, start doing puzzles. That can be a really great way to do it, to improve it. If you're having a hard time remembering people's names, you can start practicing that. There was 
somebody, some doctor I was reading about, and he and his wife love reading Russian novels because there's so many names they have to keep track of, and they discuss them as a way of, of keeping their name memory game up. <laughs> My memory is very strange. Names have always been a challenge, so I can't say that I've developed that early. Yeah. <laughs> it's waiting there to be developed, obviously. Yeah. But the interesting thing that happens to me is I'll remember the first initial. The name starts with W. And then, of course, then someone will say, you yeah. mean oh, William Smith? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And so it's a very interesting thing for me. I've tried a lot of techniques to remember names. And when I put my mind to it, this is the interesting thing. When I really put my mind to it, I'm in a group and it's important that I remember people's names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do it. Say if I leave the room, <laughs> I leave that event or whatever. I was like, okay, done with that. I don't know why I file these things away. Yeah, I think there's all different kinds of tricks in terms of learning names. And one of the best ones, having gone through medical school, is to link it to something else is to create a story, a narrative around it. If you're not a good names and dates person, sometimes you're probably a really good narrative person and look at things contextually. So if you can weave that name into a context, that can be helpful. Wendy, Wendy is willowy and walks like the wind, likes doing something like that. So you may forget Wendy, but you'll remember willowy or walks like the wind. And you're like, all right, that's right. It's Wendy. <laughs> that's her name. <laughs> That's a good one. I always use the excuse that I had a family member with an eidetic memory and I just never needed it. <laughs> All of the things that I'm offering up are things that you can choose to do if you want to do, but if you don't want to put effort into it, that's totally your choice. <laughs> Which brings us around full circle about some of the lifestyle things you mentioned. Uh, let's delve a little bit deeper into that because my first thought when you said it's all changeable, it's lifestyle, it's it, things like that. I, don't, I was going to myself... That's the simplest thing for us to do, probably the least expensive to change our eating habits, our exercise habits, all of those sleep better, all of those things. I want to get around to this question, but why are we so resistant to the easiest thing? We're always looking for that amazing test or miracle. That's a big question. So why are we resistant to the thing? I think I'd say I want to respond to that in two levels. One Somewhat flippantly and culturally, I would just say that we're, we just like a quick, sexy fix. We just think that something should be a quick and that it should be all the marketing shine that everything else is sold to us in, in this culture. And if it doesn't have that, there's no sex appeal to it. It's like, why it's not a shiny, bright package. <laughs> I'm not that interested. And I think that that's really, we're so out of touch with what it takes to just live a basic human healthy life in this culture we have been for a long time now that we forget the power of the basic things and the basics and then i'd say the other reason why we resist is due to subconscious things what's in your subconscious mind that's some of us actually are running resistance to be in our fullest potential to be in our fullest self to be in our healthiest I'm not saying that to say that it you made yourself sick or this is your fault. I really want to be really careful with that. I've struggled with a lot of chronic illness in my life and I and I get that those labels can be thrown on. And yet I know that as I do my deeper healing, as I do my really really deep subconscious work on myself, these layers come up that I'm I'm almost surprised to find. I go, "Whoa. No wonder I've been procrastinating because I've been fearing being this big part of myself, like I've been fearing being attacked if I if I shine brighter or something like that. It's a subconscious thing, be it generational trauma or family trauma, early childhood, and that's in that subconscious mind, which is one of the reasons why, to back to your first question about that autonomic nervous response, we tend to have that, I wasn't even aware that I was thinking about anything stressful, yet my body responded a lot of that is due to those stories and narratives we have in our subconscious mind. My experience has been personally and with people that I work with, when we really are really ready to do the work and we actually work on the subconscious level, then there's a lot less resistance to just doing the basic stuff. I know that's true for me. It's, oh, of course, I'm going to drink my green juice or eat well. I, I love me. <laughs> I want to take care of me. I'm not fighting me anymore. We've had Sarah Payton on and she talks about these unconscious contracts and it's similar to what you're talking about, these yeah. little things that we tell ourselves. And some of the work I've done, it's 
things will come up like it's a time that I got embarrassed in fifth grade or something. Right. It's like the strangest thing that I hadn't thought about in years. Right. And during a time of reflection, things are like, oh, wow, that that you know, that really does make sense and feel the same. Right. What's happened for me is just having the acknowledgement or the yeah. conscious awareness now of, right. oh, right. yeah, I don't like to feel that way. Right. But here it is all these decades later. You're okay. You're not that little kid in fifth grade. You have control over your okayness here. So helpful is just yeah. taking yeah. those unconscious things and making them conscious. Yeah, I still have the adrenaline rush, or I still have that moment where I'm like feeling a little wobbly. But what's been really great is that I also then have the somewhat immediate next response of, oh, I know what this is. We've dealt with it before. Yeah. And you're okay. Exactly. Yeah. And that, again, is that becomes a very short turnaround time for you, for your brain and for your nervous system. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's amazing how those subconscious pieces are in there. And sometimes they can be from past generational memories, or they can be things that we took on for our parents or other family members as well. And so sometimes they're not even our stories and it can be great to be like, oh, it's not even mine. I really don't need to react. <laughs> like, it's not even mine. Then I think the next step from just recognizing that they're there. And when we respond to go, oh, that's right. It's fifth grade, Sharon. We're good. We're fine. Is to then have that subconscious mind be filled up with more of who you truly, really, truly are. And so that there's more moments of being in that joy and love of who you are and having that become the dominant state. Now, when we get to that state, our nervous system becomes regulated in a very healthy way. That's when we really are in our ultimate rest and digest. We're able to heal our tissues. The body's not in its fight state. It's not in an inflamed state. It calms down and it goes into a normal stasis, which is why some people have miracle cures when they do really deep work at retreats or on vacations or things like that. It's really the, the nervous system shifts when we know deep in our core and every single cell that we are okay as we are. Wow, absolutely fascinating. And time flies by. I've totally blown past the time for our quick commercial break. So guys, we'll be right back with Dr. Jenny Tafinki and we're going to talk more about brain inflammation. And I promise to stay more on topic. I just, when I get with Jenny, it just goes crazy. The Autoimmune Hour will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by understandingautoimmune.com to learn more. Ohm Times TV Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my, my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Dr. Jenny Tefankian, and she has been treating chronic illness for over two decades and having complex chronic fatigue herself. She had no choice but to dig into how to heal ourselves. And one of the things that she's been working on is understanding brain inflammation, brain fog. I think I've heard it called fibro fog, other all sorts of things like that is when our brain isn't working optimum. 
she mentioned that it's just like leaky gut. We can have leaky brain. So we're going to continue to explore all these topics. And I know I've gotten to gentle several times with Dr. Jenny. I just love how her mind works. So I didn't know what it felt like to be in rest and digest. Right. The other was so common to me that when I went into rest and digest, it was almost unsettling because I was like, okay, what's this? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it was a very strange thing that yeah. and others around me like, you're fine. That was a little unnerving as I went through the process of letting down the stress and understanding that and getting into rest and digest. This is a big thing that you're talking about right now. This is big. This is really big because we get into the habit of feeling under stress. And when you're dealing with a chronic illness, your body is, it's biochemically under stress. It's physiologically under stress. And it is really hard to not have your brain also be under stress from the fact that your body is not behaving in the way you would like it to be, or you fear it's going to crash. These kinds of things create this like just this constant tape of, am I okay? Am I safe? Am I okay? Am I safe? Am I okay? And you're always looking for the danger because your body doesn't feel totally strong and able. We can also get addicted to that feeling. That becomes the box that we know. That is home. That feeling unsafe becomes what we consider identify as being safe. And therefore, when we have a moment, like you said, Sharon, when you're fully in rest and digest, when your body is at peace, part of you is, what's this? Where where am I? I don't recognize this planet. And it can feel unsafe because you're no longer on alert. And you're just like, no, I need to put my alert signs back up because something bad could happen. That's how I've been operating all of these decades. Something bad is going to happen, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I think that this is the big, 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 big challenge and the big, big invite for all of us who have dealt with chronic illness for months, years, and decades is to practice, start practicing being in the safe homeostatic state and allowing ourselves to trust what it feels like to be there. And things will come up. And in terms of that, are you sure this is okay? Or what about this? Or what about that lab test? Or what about this feeling you're experiencing? You can still acknowledge those and still identify with being safe. Does that make sense? It does now that I'm here. <laughs> but it's an <laughs> interesting, it's an interesting dynamic as you're moving through it. It wasn't linear, for sure. No. How I figured it out is or that time between going back into fight, flight, freeze, or as Sarah calls it, and I think it's yeah. really more than fight, flight, or freeze, but it's more of a general state of low-level alarm. That was home base. And what was yeah. powerful for me was understanding what rest and digest felt like. And as I could tell, I was doing better at it, that the process of staying in rest and digest where the body heals was that time between recognizing, oh, Sharon, you're over here in the land of alarm. Let's work back. When that got shorter and shorter, so it's not like I never go into the land of alarm anymore, right. but it's all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm in the land of alarm. I'm right. going to go over here now. So it was like when those two transitions got shorter and shorter, I knew I was on the right path. I think that makes sense. A full disclosure, I'm sure that part of why I got long COVID is because the amount of stress that I was under prior to getting the infection. And even with all that I know, even having healed my limbic brain in the past, even having come out of deep, 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 very ill chronic fatigue, 150% better, teaching this stuff to doctors, teaching this stuff, having courses, all the stuff that I do, I was still, I was still the frog in my own water pot. And because I was, the stress was not around my health, the stress was around a business thing. And it was during the pandemic, I was so isolated and I put so much into something that wasn't working. And I put so much of, I put so much stress around that, that I actually started to trigger my own negative thinking, my own limbic brain again. And it was disguised. It I, I hid it from myself as a, oh, this is work. I just need to keep going. I need to keep pushing. I need to figure out how to make this work. It took me a little while to realize how much it was pulling my body down. I did begin to notice that and stopped it, but I had already done the damage 
to my gastrointestinal tract, which is if your GI is messed up, you are more vulnerable to any of these chronic conditions. And that was the setup for me. So that when I got sick with COVID, it became long COVID. That was the setup. And I'm very aware that that's what it is. So there's no part of me that says this is easy. This is the hardest work we do. Our brains are are wired to survive. So of course, we're always looking for the danger. Yet we do have this amazing brain where we can do this thing called metacognition. We can watch ourselves thinking. And so we do have the ability to shift that thinking if we're willing to do the work. And it's not linear. It's definitely a process. I find it's like peeling an onion or going, it's like, oh, I feel amazing on this. Oh, now I don't. Okay, next thing to work on. That's coming up. Okay, now I gotta feel amazing. Okay, here's the next project. Absolutely. But the thing that sometimes bugs me I'm all of a sudden I'm going, didn't I peel this layer of this onion a decade ago? Why is it this popping up again? I think when it comes back, I totally agree. I've had that in, in the past, but I, I guess I see it, if I'm really honest, I see it as a spiral. And I think that we're going down and, and it's a deeper and deeper layer. And there was a layer that we couldn't address when we were 35, but now that we can address a few de- decades later, because we're older and wiser and we're ready to make that shift. I think ready is the key point. I think early in my autoimmune disease, I was wanting other people to just, just fix it, just fix it. It wasn't until I understood this idea of ready that became important. And also, what was circling back to earlier, some of the things we talked about, I wanted to bring up this idea of ownership of the labels that we do. Oftentimes when I talk to people, and guys, this has nothing to do with brain fog. I'm running down a rabbit hole on Dr. Jenny here. But one of the things I wanted to mention was oftentimes when someone, white coat authority, whatever, gives us a label you have, and they give us this big fancy word that we can't spell, we take that on as as who we are. Mm-hmm. And I'm often suggesting loudly, no, that is just information. And that's when I felt my shift, my consciousness, subconsciousness made the biggest shift was when I realized, am I taking ownership of this particular label? What was the shift for you in taking the ownership? Was it that you saying, I don't own it or I do own it? What was your path of view? It wasn't about owning it as I don't want it. So it was really, I guess at the point you get so frustrated, I know when I have this certain tone of my voice and I'll say to a friend, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. That's the moment that you're able to shift. I I totally agree. I really fought the diagnosis of chronic fatigue when I first, somebody first put, tried to put that label on me in the early nineties. I was like, get your label off of me. I don't want it. And I refused it. And then there was a point where I had to accept the label in order to actually begin to take care of myself. There was, I think there's different phases of resistance and accepting and then moving on. And I think that there's a a place of, of this thing is coming to mind of I had a friend years ago named Sally who just discovered that she had food sensitivities and she would come to a dinner party with all these people. Everyone was in their 20s and she would just say, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. I can't eat that. And that was her like energy of I can't eat that. And she had just been diagnosed with with ME and she's like, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. I have ME. And it felt like she was creating more of a wall around herself in terms of that being a fear response around her diagnosis, rather than coming from a place of saying, looking at the table and saying, oh, I can eat this. I can eat the salad. That's going to work for me. And I did bring this other thing that I can eat with the salad. So that's going to be mine. And yes, knowing that she had the diagnosis of ME, But because she had that diagnosis, she was going to choose to take better care of herself until that diagnosis no longer resonated with her. Now, we've run down a lot of rabbit holes. We have about 15 minutes left, but I do want to get back, guys. Sorry, we did start this conversation around brain inflammation, and we've been circling a lot of the topics around brain inflammation. I would love to just open it up to you, Jenny, and share with us some of your vast knowledge about brain inflammation. And I'll just stay out of my rabbit holes and tangentials here. Should we say that brain inflammation in one sign may be that you can't focus and stay on (laughs) (laughs) Sure, we can say that. (laughs) Although I don't want to use it as excuse. (laughs) One of the things that I think is really key and significant for us to understand about brain inflammation, I'm just going to, two concepts that I just really want to get across today. One is that 
there's this thing called glial priming that when your brain suffers an injury of any sort, this could be soccer ball headers, this could be falling off a horse, it could be any kind of physical trauma, it can be a big virus, big viral infection, toxic exposure. It can be from mold exposures, from heavy metals, from environmental things. Anytime our brain has a significant event, or it can be an emotional trauma, really traumatic childhood, or even a lot of small traumas that your body and being interpreted as a large trauma, all of these are insults to the brain that set the, the glial, it's called glial priming. It sets the microglia up and ready and on alert for any other next time there's some sort of insult that's going to come in. It's called glial priming. And it's one of the reasons why people who have one concussion, that's a big fall, they have a bad concussion. And then a year later, they just bonk their head on the kitchen cupboard and they feel foggy brained and out of it. And they're like, why? I just bonked it. It's because of this thing called glial priming. What we've realized is that this is a crossover thing. It's just not one concussion that leads to a concussion. You can have a concussion and then get a virus and then have an emotional trauma. Each one of those is considered a trauma to the brain and the brain doesn't know the difference. It just knows it's been attacked and it needs to actually exert a certain kind of immune response to take care of that problem. And this is the second thing I want to share, the second concept I want to share that's that's interesting and unique about the brain and really, I think, sheds a light on how it is that we need to treat this in a different way. Our whole body has a natural inflammatory response to things. And that's part of everywhere that the body has the ability to have an inflammatory response. This has a potential good benefit. A fever is an inflammatory response to an illness which sets off the fire alarm and lets the immune system know it needs to get active. It needs to bring attention to this infectious agent so that it can get rid of it and let the body heal. If you twist your ankle, it gets inflamed. You overstretch those tendons and ligaments, it gets inflamed because you need to stop walking on it, one, and it needs to bring more nutrients and activate the immune system so that it can heal. If you twist your ankle and leave it alone, it has a normal 72 hour peak cycle where peak inflammation is at three days later and then it starts to go down. The brain, when it gets inflamed from a virus, from a bonk or something like that, it doesn't have that 72 hour stop. It stays inflamed until something comes in and stops it being inflamed. Now the microglia, their alert team, their fireman team up there in the immune system when they are, they're usually out being really super helpful. They're usually when you're not in a high inflamed state, they're cleaning up broken neurons. They're, they're destroying the ones that are destroyed, but the ones that are just a little bit not doing super great, they help them heal and nurture them. And, and they're just surveying the brain, making sure everything is copacetic in your brain neighborhood. But if it, the brain is on fire, if there's been some sort of insult to the brain, all of a sudden those microglia are activated and they go a little bit overboard in some situations and start attacking and breaking down neurons that are not dead and not totally sick, but just a little bit not perfect. And they start destroying those. And so that we get a decrease of our neurons from that microglia being overactive and destroying them. This is exactly what's happening when people are struggling with brain fog and with fatigue from any condition, whether it's a physical injury or whether it's from myalgic encephalitis or any kind of autoimmune condition. And this is the exact same thing that's happening that we're finding is happening with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and that kind of thing. It's an overactive immune reaction in the brain itself. And sometimes they're reacting to a certain thing. When we looked at it was decades ago, we started to pull apart those neuro tangles of Alzheimer's. And went, oh, oh, look, we found the discovery. What is it that causes Alzheimer's? Look, it's, it's, it's chlamydia because there's chlamydia in this tangle. And we're like, come over here. I'm like, oh no, we found it. Oh no, it's metal. Look, look, we found it because there's a metal in this neuro tangle. And we quickly began to figure out, oh, it's not one thing. It's a number of things. When you have that blood brain barrier that gets expanded and so that more things that shouldn't cross the blood brain barrier do 
then we're more likely to have a reaction. So I think our incredible abundance of dementias that are happening right now, I didn't grow up in a city where people were shuffling down the street. And now I see it everywhere where people are walking, have the Parkinson's walk. We're having this for a multitude of reasons. And I believe that there are things that we can do to stop this condition. And those of us who have had autoimmune conditions, chronic fatigue, ME, we are, I hate to say it, but we're at higher risk for this. But what I love to say is that knowledge is power. And you knowing this means that you can take action and choose to live your life differently and take action to get that inflammation down. And there are a whole lot of things in the natural world that will bring that inflammation down. These are things that I'm doing now with myself, with people in my clinic and sharing because they are tools that are accessible to all of us. And there are many lifestyle things that we can do to get that inflammation down on a day in and day out basis. Okay. I'm uh, sitting here a little stunned. That's amazing. I did not know a lot of that information and especially the idea that it's not just one trigger, it's multiple triggers. Let's start with the simple. What are a couple of the simple tips that you can give that can give people a big bang for their buck? Now, let me think about where to start. How many minutes do we have? Yeah, I know we're late, but go ahead. We'll, let, we'll go for about another 10 minutes. With my, I, I'm thinking about the idea of one of the things that I had the biggest bang for my buck was exercise. Yeah. And I hear from other autoimmune people, Sharon, I can't even walk. I get it. But it didn't start with me walking a mile. It started me walking from one side of the room to the couch. I used to call them the four pillars of health. I added a fifth one since the pandemic. And what I really think is the best thing is to look at those pillars and to figure out which ones of yours need the most support. And the first one is digestion and detoxification. So we know that if you have a leaky brain, you have a leaky gut. So if you have gastrointestinal issues, if you have irritable bowel syndrome, if you have diarrhea, constipation, gas and bloating and pain, if you know that when you eat that chocolate cheesecake, you don't feel so good, these are signs that there's something going on with your gut and healing that gut, I think is a number one thing. So that's not a small, easy thing to do, but that would be like the first project that I would step into knowing that this is going to be a long-term game. And even if it takes months or years for you to heal your brain, you're still saving yourself decades, potentially improving decades worth. Sleep is huge. If you're not sleeping, you're not healing. Your glymphatic system is, is the system inside your brain that gets rid of toxins. The brain needs to have the ability to take the garbage out to the street so that the garbage man can pick it up. That happens when we sleep. That glymphatic system literally dumps toxins out of your brain while you're sleeping at night. So being sure you're getting at least seven hours in a dark, quiet room of sleep is great. Sleep, if sleep is challenging for you, then that's the foundation for you to focus on. That's your project. That's your first project. I'd say those two are huge mindset and spirit is another health foundation. If you're running around feeling like everyone's out to get you, the world's a terrible place and you have absolutely no power in it and you're really in your victim, then that's a place that I recommend you get support because that means that you are 24 seven running that stress system consciously and unconsciously. And it's very hard for the brain to not feel like it has something to fight if you're always fighting you. So learning how to come back to a place of love and compassion. And a lot of us who have had trauma early on, we can't find that by ourselves. We need someone to help us. So finding the right person to support you, to guide you, to find your love and compassion for yourself. And then to have a practice where when we all have our days and moments where we get tripped up, you have a practice you can return to to help you. And then the other foundation is movement and rhythm. And I totally agree with you, Sharon, like movement is huge. The body, we're meant to move. We're meant to be walking and walking all day long. The four phases of being able to move. And the first is just using the power of your mind. If you just imagine yourself lifting weights, you get 30% benefit of lifting those weights. So just imagine yourself going on that walk actually begins to shift your physiology towards exercise. So there are different levels of, and then another exercise is just using breath work, which is huge. And another one beyond that is doing very low level yin yoga, that kind of thing. So there's different levels that you can go on and you may be at a different level a different day. And then the fifth one that I brought in is connection. So what is your connection to yourself, to your community and to your higher self, whatever you consider that to be like, those are essential parts. 
when we focus on those health foundations, everything works better. The other piece I would just say to just step in and say blood sugar regulation is huge. So keeping your stress and your blood sugar consistent has a huge impact on how the brain functions, keeping it adequately fueled with enough food in there. Because an inflamed brain is a hungry brain. You may be craving sugar because your brain is on fire and you want more nutrition. So those are some of the things that I would say outside of <laughs> then also looking at what are the root causes that are toxic to your brain and figuring out how to remove those. Wow. I think we need another session on brain inflammation for sure. This has been so fascinating. And I think brain inflammation is too often overlooked in our wellness and our care facilities. They're oh too, my gosh. For sure. too quick to <laughs> throw a bandaid on it and call it good. Yeah. It, took me a while and finally someone said I think you have brain inflammation and once we started treating it it was like wow yeah this is what yeah. my brain should feel like absolutely there's a lot of nutrients that the brain needs that we don't know how to feed it and there are a lot of things that we do in this culture that don't work well for the brain and just understanding what those are and getting those out are great so yeah so I'm starting to talk about it a lot more which I'm really excited about and will be teaching on this in multiple platforms. I know our interview here is in March of 2024. And in April, what are you doing? You're going to have a special class on it, right? I'll be doing a master class. And I'm really going to be dialing into this whole brain inflammation piece and teaching about some of the other things that you can do to really begin to address that brain inflammation. And I am on a couple of different summits where I am talking about that as well. There's going to be a lot of great information that if you're interested, then I would suggest just get on my email list because then you'll be sure to get notified for exactly when we're doing it. Okay. And your URL is what? drjennytufankian.com. Jenny, J-E-N-N-Y, Tufankian, T as in Tom, U, F as in Frank, E, N as in Nancy, K-I-A-N.com. Fantastic. Thank you. And we'll have that up on the website, everyone over at understandingautoimmune.com as a clickable link as well. Because sometimes remembering her last name, we, that's why we all lovingly call her Dr. Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> and she's awesome. So I want everyone to go over to drjennytofankian.com. And she's got all sorts of free options there. And you can get a hold of her if she's sparked your interest because she's awesome. She has loads of experience to help you through this. She is someone who's been through it herself. And those are the kinds of people I like working with because I don't always have the words to explain what's happening, but if they've been through it themselves, they, they get it on that level. They're like, yeah, I too was stuck for a word to explain X, Y, Z. So that's, what's fantastic about it. And even if you haven't had a chance and you're watching this after April, 2024, <laughs> go to her website. She's always offering great new insights and classes and opportunities to experience more of your health and wellness and being, and that you can overcome these so-called chronic conditions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenny, for sharing with us today. Sharon, I really appreciate it. It's always awesome to see you. And everyone, have a great week, whatever your adventures, and join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.